There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. Maya Angelou For over 20 years now, I have had the pleasure of working as a personal trainer. In that time, I have experienced a vast spectrum of human nature in all its imperfections. I have learned, taught, laughed, cried, been angered, and felt sorrow. The one feeling I do not have is regret. For each interaction is a story unto itself, and like any good story, they should be told. Only when we're no longer afraid do we begin to live. Dorothy Thompson I thought I had found the answer in 1993. A gymnastics coach for six years in three different states, I had conquered the challenges of coaching children, and now I was taking on a new demographic. My internship at St. John's Medical introduced me to the senior population, and to me, the great unknown. Having grown up, never meeting my paternal grandparents, and living nine hours away from my maternal grandmother, this childhood lacked the experience of the older generations and found such interactions as awkward and therefore avoidable. Thankfully, I was forced into teaching a senior circuit class in a burgeoning cardiac rehabilitation program, which gave me the experience that would benefit me greatly in my career. In three months, I was not only running the class, but was regularly visiting with my new experienced friends outside of the health center, and my fears were all but abated. I thought that, in this short amount of time, I had all but conquered my anxiety and mastered all the challenges of senior fitness. (laughs) What I did not know, and would learn in time, They were far more afraid of me than I had ever been afraid of them. In 1996, I gained my first official senior client, a charming 68-year-old fitness enthusiast whose history of exercise spanned longer than my years on the planet. This made for an easy introduction to what would become an enormous part of my business. Unbeknownst to me, this relationship was making me approachable to the curious geriatric population who so needed my expertise. Ethel ushered in a flood of kind, experienced souls seeking a safe haven for longevity through exercise. Over the next six months, my clientele would grow from six clients to 42, with over 50% of them over the age of 65. The lion's share of that, Ethel was responsible for. I did not realize it till years later how big an obstacle Ethel had removed from me. Senior clients seemed to pour in like water from a faucet, and I developed a comfort level I never dreamed possible. Interactions became second nature. I had more than enough education of senior fitness, and the multitude of clientele made the flow of the sessions natural for both client and trainer. No introductions were more valuable than with Bethany, whom Ethel brought to me after our first week working out together. Hear the phrase, brought to me is literal. Bethany had no experience with fitness and was so scared to venture into this healthy lifestyle with a personal trainer that she would not even set up a consult, but instead, at the behest of Ethel, reluctantly decided to join Ethel on one of her sessions. I was surprised when she, Bethany, refused to even shake my hand at our first meeting, preferring to remain in what shadows she could find in a brightly lit personal training facility. It was made clear I was to be observed and not engaged. To this day, I cannot recall the performance I produced that led to Bethany's first actual session, but I am ever grateful that our master puppeteer had carefully used me to weave a tale of comfort and security for my new client. Others were not so fearful. Having partaken in fitness through other venues, they only need a familiar mobile name and a sound endorsement from a formidable fitness enthusiast such that Ethel was. The phone calls became redundant. This is Jane. Actually, Bill told me I should call you. Uh, your mom and I are symphony friends. This is Billy. I'm a friend of Joe's, and I knew your folks back in the old neighborhood. Hey, Garrett, you know your client Ethel told me about you. Uh, I used to be a client of your dad. They all seem to have a safe door to walk through, and a connection to my family, which made it easy to begin a conversation. Through this whirlwind of client growth in the senior market, I subconsciously began to make notes on how to approach this demographic by learning what they needed to feel safe. 
Outside of the basic need for fitness and a healthy lifestyle, which was simple to conclude for anyone, it seemed they needed three situations to exist in order to venture into this unknown. First, a trusted friend's recommendation was sought in order to consider looking my way. Second, the typical small town characteristic of don't you know his family? Connection which made it okay to do business with a local mobilian. And third, a brief conversation with the potential hire that made them feel safe and confident in my abilities. There was no question that I had the ability. The challenge lay in how to get them to hear that expertise in a short phone conversation. In this predicament, questions and a patient ear became my friend. What daily physical challenges are you experiencing? When you get moving in the morning, does the lower back pain seem to subside? Are you a bit nervous stepping up on a curve or crossing a threshold? Conveying an understanding for their situation and taking careful time to listen to the answers made the consultations easier to schedule. After three years, I felt as if I had no challenge to reaching this demographic. I now had a large percentage of my business from the ranks of the AARP and believed this no longer proved a challenge. I was in for a rude awakening at a fundraiser for the C-Lab. During the cocktail hour, I noticed a familiar face who was about to cross the room to speak to me. It was in that moment, I realized the next day while reflecting on the evening, my first inclination was to completely avoid him. Anyone who knew our history would be completely surprised to hear this. This extremely polite friend to all was actually the father of a childhood friend, a boating contemporary of my father, a former neighbor, and one of my health care providers during my teen years. As I pondered the situation the next day, it dawned on me why I was seeking to escape his attention. For years, I would encounter this genteel man, and we would set upon what would typically be a long conversation. Jim liked to talk, and he also never met a stranger. A deacon of his church, Jim convinced many a sinner to grace its doors on a Sunday morning and had the blessings of extreme popularity amongst his female, blue-haired contemporaries. It was not well established if this was due to his undying charm or because of his ability to drive at night. Either way, as with the Mobile community, Jim was quite popular. Our conversations took us to some wonderful stories of days gone by, but always ventured into his need for my services. I'm going to come down and see you one day. He would always promise and then follow with a litany of excuses that prevented a retired widower from accommodating such a demanding scheduling proposition. The dilemma arose when we fell into this same conversation every single time we spoke. I'm going to come down and see you one day. The empty promise would come as would the ridiculous set of excuses. After the umpteenth time, I realized that as we ventured into our usual dance concerning his need for exercise, it seemed that I was not the real target of his conversation. His gaze would gloss over a bit as he fell deeper in thought and appeared to be actually trying to convince himself. I felt a deep respect for my friend and therefore obligated to remain the figurative listener, all the while sensing the need to involve myself elsewhere. So here we were. Jim crossing the room and me trying to sense whether there was wriggle room to leave or was I caught in the politeness tractor beam. A Southern gentleman to the end, I, along with my wife Stephanie, who by now more than understood my predicament and had many a time allowed me to escape while she became the sacrificial listener, waited to receive Jim, but this time with a slightly different tack. When the conversation wound itself to the eventual talk of health, And Jim offered up, I'm gonna come down and... I placed my hand on his arm, stopping him, and said, You tell me that all the time. Is it ever really going to happen? I was well aware that I may be overstepping my bounds, but I felt by now I was either going to continue to enable or I was going to try a new way to make a difference. Only time would tell if my gamble had worked. Edmund. Like Jim... Edmund was aware of my work, but unlike Jim, Edmund and I did not have a history together. A legend in the Mobile area who enhanced many a life, Edmund was more than familiar to me. I was not aware that he knew of Garrett Williamson or Personal Edge Fitness. We were formally introduced at a Rotary meeting, and after we parted ways, I learned that he asked a mutual friend to clarify who I was. 
Upon learning my identity as the personal trainer he evidently had heard much about, he sought me out in the buffet line to inquire more about my services. We exchanged contact information and left each other with the understanding that I was to hear from him in the coming days. A week later, after no word from Edmund, I decided to reach out to him. He apologized for any neglect and asked if I could possibly meet him for a consultation. As I attempted to arrange my usual office consult, he interrupted and asked if we could meet at his home. I have always been willing to accommodate such a request due to the desire to put a potential client at ease and to aid in developing a trusting relationship. I stated such, but when we were not able to find an agreeable time due to my demanding schedule, he forfeited the request and reluctantly submitted to an office meeting. Both Jim and Edmund exhibited a pattern of reluctance, which began to be commonplace among the over 70 crowd, and one that left me quite perplexed. It was a pattern of fear. I was very shocked by this so far into my career. Had I not cut my teeth? Had I not established myself not only as a high-qualified trainer, but also a friend to the senior market? Since they, like so many others, lived in close proximity with all my clients, whether considering location, socioeconomic status, family history, mobile nativity, these two checked all the boxes, as did I. Why the hesitation? It was blatantly obvious that they had the need and were actively wanting to take the next step, but why did they second guess? It was becoming a familiar and albeit frustrating pattern for which I could not find an answer. My gamble with Jim paid off, and as I had assured him in his consultation, he thoroughly appreciated his fitness program and was completely smitten with his trainer, Lindsay. He would not miss a session. There was even a story of him meeting a high school friend he had not seen in decades and cutting the lunch a bit short so he would not miss his appointment with Lindsay. Jim was convinced. As expected, Edmund followed suit. We were able to work out a schedule with he and Joshua Gooch, which Edmund maintained like clockwork. He followed his routine religiously, only stopping in the workout when he saw me to thank me for getting him involved and letting me know how much improvement he had made. I was hearing from all our mutual friends how Edmund could not stop talking about his exercise program and how it made him feel. Jim's family reached out to thank not only me, but Lindsay for all we had done to improve Jim's life. It was then that I finally had the perfect way of getting the answer to solving my predicament of not reaching those seniors who fit all the criteria to be clients, but were reluctant. I finally had two men who I was sure would know the answer. At the conclusion of both Jim and Edmund's next workouts, I pulled each aside and asked if they would be interested in grabbing coffee sometime to discuss some challenges that I felt they were uniquely qualified to solve. Both agreed, and we scheduled separate meetings for the next week. Side note, I was introduced to the poetry of Robert Burns at a young age, and though I am a fan, I had no idea how much a line out of his To a Louse would describe much of the challenges of my career. Would some power the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us? To me, defines what, as personal trainers, we deal with on a daily basis. Clearly, I am in the health business, but vanity is my favorite sin. No matter the perception someone has of their own image, the ability to see themselves as others see them would be invaluable. Nowhere could this be more valuable to me than to understand how a potential client especially one who we are specially trained to help, perceives us. These two meetings would open my eyes to that reality. I first met with Jim, and lacking the eloquence of Edmund, he fished for reasons why he at first hesitated to actually contact me. I reminded him of the many encounters we had where he would talk almost endlessly about the need and the plan for help. He spoke about many menial excuses. But as we talked, he began to get that faraway look when I was certain it was not important that I be present. As he did in the social settings, he started to drift into his own mind and more or less talk to himself. This is where I knew the answer would come. Edmund was far more succinct. A brilliant man and well-known expert on a variety of subjects, he took my request very seriously and started to look inward to investigate even before our meeting. After our small talk and pleasantries were dismissed, 
I asked him my question, and he replied with a very detailed and well-researched answer, which confirmed what Jim had told me. Garrett, when I was in high school, our coaches were bullies. I was a very gifted athlete and could play almost any sport. I loved athletics, but soon lost all desire to play any high school sport because of these horrible, abusive bullies who paraded themselves as athletic authorities. I sought out individual sports where I could, in essence, coach myself. I took up fencing and horseback, particularly jumping, and excelled. I started to reply, and then he stopped me. That wasn't all. After high school, the draft was on, and I went to boot camp. Looking back, I realized that was my last interaction with anyone you would consider a coach. Our drill sergeants picked up where my high school coaches left off. The yelling, the screaming, the negative talk. Though I thoroughly understand the necessity of it, and it did exactly what we needed it to do, considering the hell we were about to face. It did nothing to change my image of any athletic instructor. With some power, the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. I thought I now understood, but he added one last concept that, had he not, I am certain this valuable concept would have eluded me forever. I worked hard all my life and made more than my share of mistakes. I always thought failure at a task was a way to learn and grow. Looking back, I see that some of my greatest achievements came from my biggest failures, and for that I'm thankful. I was well aware that I needed to do something about my fitness, but I knew nothing about it, and at this point in my life, I have no interest in failing at anything. It all finally made sense. The pattern of reluctance which began to be commonplace among the over 70 crowd, and one that left me quite perplexed, now had been answered. I've said in many consultations that we fight the image of a Hollywood personal trainer. And you know the type, a rather large, over-muscled, ex-wannabe athlete who seeks to make you bigger and celebrate your pain and trying to attain this goal. It was now clear that for a certain demographic, my consultation repertoire needed a bit more character development. Learning the physical limitations of someone at this stage in their life has become far less important than understanding and overcoming their fears.